more important. Look at verse 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Not will have, please note, whoever hears my word and believes already has it. If you are believing today that Christ loved you and gave himself for you, you have eternal life now. It's not something you get when he comes again. You have it legally now. It's only manifested, it's obvious at the second coming. But you have it now. It says that. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. Now some Bibles have is not judged. NIV says condemned and rightly so. The Greek word is often translated judged. But in John's Gospel and his epistles and in Revelation, whenever judgment is mentioned, it's always in a negative sense. It always means condemnation. Why is that important? Well, a lot of good Christian people read Revelation 14, 6 and 7. The hour of his judgment has come and think it means a pre-advent investigative judgment of the saints. But all the way through the book of Revelation, that word has a negative meaning of condemnation for the wicked. So please, we must not read that into Revelation 14, 6 and 7. It's certainly not talking about an investigative judgment of the saints. It's talking about condemnation. So when you get to 1810, talking about that wicked power of Babylon, remember that terrible whore? that dressed up meretricious, boastful, bloody, because she puts people to death. It says, in one hour is thy judgment come. That's 18.10. Now compare that with Revelation 14, 6 and 7. The hour of his judgment is come. That's Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Now 18.10, about Babylon, in one hour has thy judgment come. So when we read in John 5, 24, if you believe you have eternal life, you've crossed over from death to life and you're not condemned, that's a correct translation, even though some translations use the word judged. But in John's writings, judged always is negative. In Revelation it occurs about eight times, always negative, every time. But isn't that good news? This is the news of Romans 8. There's no condemnation of them that are in Christ. And remember, that's talking about sinful, erring, failing Christians. That's me. That's you. For in many things we all offend. Whenever you pray, say, forgive us our trespasses. But it is erring Christians who are told there's no condemnation. That is wonderful news. Some people's consciences are as good as new because they've never been used but if you have a good conscience, it will trouble you, try to trouble you many times a day, and the only answer is the gospel. Please note that. If you have a healthy conscience, it will condemn you many times a day. You should have done better. You shouldn't have done that. You were forgetful here. You were careless there. The only answer is the gospel. There's no condemnation. Remember the previous verses, Paul saying, things I would I do not, things I would not those I do, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So with my mind I serve the law of God, with my flesh I serve the law of sin. But there's no condemnation. He didn't mean he was committing adultery or stealing or lying or blaspheming. He just knew that he wasn't as loving, he wasn't as prayerful, he wasn't as thankful, and neither are you or me. But there's no condemnation. Same as Romans 4.8. Blessed is the one whom the Lord will not impute sin. He doesn't impute our failures to us. That's wonderful news. Your conscience and mine, they impute our failures, but God doesn't. Remember it says in 1 John, if our hearts condemn us, and mine does many times a day, but John says if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts 
That's very good news. We mustn't put our failures on a pedestal, mournfully worship our failures for several days, making ourselves miserable, and then thinking we've paid enough of a price, and then we begin to live normally again. That's righteousness by works. We must rather say with Luther, the Christian's always a sinner, always a penitent, always right with God. Christian hates sin, fights sin. Sin remains but doesn't reign. Sin can't have dominion over us, but it exists. We make mistakes, but there's no condemnation. That verse 24 is a pearl. Then uh, he goes to give testimonies about himself, the testimony of the father who witnessed, this is my beloved son, testimonies of his miracles. You know, the miracles of Christ were many and they were great. They weren't like the miracles you read of in the Middle Ages. They were tawdry sort of things, a statue of Mary weeping or something like that. Christ's miracles weren't like that. They were great miracles from death to life, feeding 5,000, cleansing lepers, drying up a fig tree that was a symbol of Israel by the roots, rending the veil, putting a veil over the sun. These are not tawdry miracles, are they? Christ's miracles were great, they were many, they were public and they had a marvellous character because they were all intended to bless. All intended to bless. Only one or two exceptions where there were miracles of judgement. So he gives the testimonies about himself, God's, John the Baptist, his miracles. But would you notice 39, verse 39, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's saying to the Jews, legalistically you read your Bible as a means of earning brownie points. But the purpose of the Bible is to reveal me. And it's no good reading the Bible if you don't find me. The whole Bible is a revelation of Christ from the first chapter to the last. In the very first chapter you read about chaos, darkness, the spirit moving, the word speaking, earth coming up out of the chaos, life beginning, life increasing, beings in the image of God, Sabbath rest. Well that's the story of redemption. We been, begin chaotically. Our hearts and minds are a chaos till we're converted. But the Spirit of God moves on us and the Word of God speaks to us and we rise up in newness of life. First the early fruit, penitence, sorrow for sin, so on. That more and more love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit till we come into the image of God. Then we enter into real Sabbath rest because we're one with God. So Genesis 1 is the story of Christ's redemption of every soul who becomes a believer. When you read about the first Adam, who on the sixth day of the week has his side open so he can have a bride, well, isn't that Calvary? Sixth day of the week, the last Adam has his side open to have a bride. When you read about Abel, the good shepherd, the young man who's killed because he's righteous, don't you see Jesus there? The good shepherd who, when young, is killed. When you hear Noah being told by God, you only have I seen righteous, but bring your family in. Isn't Christ our Noah? And because he's righteous, we get in. We get in. And when you read the story of Joseph, a Jew that's hated by his brethren, sold for pieces of silver to a foreign nation, falsely accused, but becomes the saviour of the world with the bread of life. What a beautiful picture. That's why the 13th chapter is given to story of Joseph and only one to the original story of creation. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are all in those 13 chapters. So Jesus says, you read the scriptures but if you don't find me there you might as well not have read them. There's no virtue in reading the Bible without seeing Christ. These are they that testify of me. I don't accept praise from men but I know you 
I know you do not have the love of God in your hearts. That is a tremendously searching statement. I wonder what he says about us. He knows us. Do our lives testify that we have the love of God in our hearts? That we're trying to love like God? That's what Christianity is about. That's what real religion is. Real religion is not church bells, tying, paying, singing and praying. Real religion is having the love of God in your hearts. And he knows. I've come in my Father's name, you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept him. That was demonstrated 64 times in the decades following the cross. 64 false messiahs came in the decades after Calvary and time after time hordes of Jews accepted the false messiah 64 times and that's what he foretold. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? That too is terribly searching. We like being praised. Most of us have a sinking feeling that we're not all we want to be. Most of us are well aware that we have many failures. And we're nowhere near our ideal. So if someone gives us a bit of praise, we lap it up like a cat with milk. But he says, how can you really believe if you covet the praise of men rather than the praise of God. That's the only praise worth anything. The praise of God. Don't think I'll accuse you. There's one who will. It's Moses. You believe Moses, you would believe me. He wrote about me. Since you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? 